So um, you could probably go ahead and get started whenever you're ready, Dr. Morley. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. I'm going to be talking you, to you today on the magic of spells. Uh, there's no magic in this talk, uh, much as I would prefer to have lots of magic. So you're going to have to do with the little wizard you're seeing now. And spells in general are basically people who have a period of unconsciousness uh, or near unconsciousness. And we're going to be talking about it. And what I want to point out to everybody, I'm going to give you huge numbers of conditions that cause spells. The reason I'm doing this is so that if you want, you can download the slides. We'll find a way for you to do it. You're welcome to have them. But it's so that when you see people having spells, you don't just say, oh, well, they are having an epileptic fit or they're having a heart attack or uh, you know something like that. There are just a lot of things and a lot of it gets missed. So really the whole purpose is to make you very aware that there are many, many causes of spells and we should pay more attention to them than we do, particularly in older people. So this is the list of the major types of spells that exist, syncope, seizures, dizziness, psychiatric, metabolic, pulmonary embolus, uh, strokes, uh, drop attacks, migraine, and narcolepsy. Uh, here are the metabolic causes, hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, hypercalcemic tetany, alkalotic tetany, acidosis, hypercapnia, low carbon dioxide, hyperventilation. So a large number of them, again, as you see, we're going to concentrate predominantly on the two major piece kinds, which are the seizures and the syncope, but I'll also talk about all the black swans and zebras towards the end. So when we compare seizures and syncope, seizures usually have a sudden onset, we all know that, whereas syncopal episodes usually have a prodrome. They start to feel as if something's wrong and then they pass out. Uh, muscle activity is variable with seizures, but with syncope, it's almost always slumping and they become floppy. Incontinence, very common in seizures. We hardly ever see it with syncope. Uh, injuries with seizure, tongue biting, dislocations, lacerations, and bruises are very common. But in syncope, because the body becomes so floppy, uh, there are minimal injuries usually. And then uh, seizure is associated with a metabolic acidosis whereas syncope isn't. So that's a starting point of trying to separate the two out. Hippocrates pointed out uh, many years ago, those who suffer, suffer from frequent and strong faint without any manifest pest uh, cause, uh, cause die suddenly. So the thought that these were not always benign was important. And uh, Mercurial uh, pointed out that syncope is associated with a slow pulse. I think that's a translation, though my Latin isn't as good as it was when I was in school. So let's now look at the causes of syncope per se. And again, there are a large number of them, and that's always the problem. You know, you look and you say, oh, gee, well, they had an arrhythmia, that's it. But obviously, lots and lots of causes. So vasovagal will be one. Carotid sinus hypersensitivity, one of the more common causes in older people, not very well looked for by physicians in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, because one of the geriatricians there has put a huge amount of effort into it. People are much more likely to look for it. Uh, there are all the cardiac causes, and we'll look at some of those. There's dehydration, anemia, uh, vasodilatation, autonomic dysfunction, and drug-induced. Uh, so let's look at these mechanisms that cause uh, syncope. There's the cardiogenic syncope. This is a sudden failure of the heart as a pump. This can either be, be because it gets too slow or alternatively too fast. So it's not just the slow, but the fast that can do it. You can have reduction of uh, venous uh, return, and when that's sudden, that's the orthostatic syncope. A sudden abnormal distribution of cardiac output, that's when you get an inappropriate arterial vasodilatation. And then chronic arterial disease, atherosclerosis, can do this as well. So we're going to go through each of these in some more detail. So let's start off with the cardiogenic syncope. And as I pointed out, really very fast uh, hearts and very slow hearts both are liable to cause syncope. And then if the heart stops, obviously you're gonna have syncope. Uh, people with prolonged QT can get uh, syncope. 
people with myxomas have syncope, and then it's seen in people with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy as well. So a number of different ways in which this can, uh, the cardiogenic syncope can occur. One of the classical examples is the Brugada syndrome. You see Dr. Brugada down there. And basically, this is a syndrome where you find right bundle branch block on the EKG, uh, and you see some ST segment elevation in V1 uh, to V3, uh, and there are arrows pointing at that e elevation on the, uh, the little EKG. And they have a propensity to develop sustained ventricular arrhythmias. So if you see those little increased segments uh, of ST segments on the EKG, think about with Brugada syndrome, send the person to a cardiologist. So how do we work up somebody with cardiac syncope? So most probably the most important thing is carotid sinus massage. We'll talk about it again in, in a minute, but and how to do it because there are places where it shouldn't be done, particularly in older people, and there is a specific way to do it. Uh, we should always look at cardiac enzymes to make sure that somebody who's fainted did not have a myocardial infarction. Uh, you would like to have an echocardiogram to see that there's nothing wrong with the way the heart is working. Uh, may need to do a stress test, looking again to see whether there's atherosclerotic disease, um, most importantly, if somebody has syncope and you can't find an answer, you can either do short-term am uh, ambulatory monitoring at home. But because most people have syncope, have it on a cardiovascular basis, have it about once every month or two months, the best way to do it is to do long-term ambulatory loop electrocardiography. And that'll pick up about 60 to 70 people, uh, percent of people who are actually having syncope. So it's a very good thing to do if there's no obvious cause. And then tilt table can be done, though there are simpler ways than tilt table. And unless you're really a, a specialist, you're not going to do tilt table. So let's look at the carotid sinus massage. Uh, it has the greatest utility in older people for picking up why uh, people with cardiac uh, syncope, but there are places you can't do it. You can't do it in somebody who has a carotid brewery. That means you've got to take your stethoscope, you've got to put it over the carotid and listen very carefully to see if there's a brewery. Uh, I'm trying to think how many times I've done that in my life well, and it's a handful, so I'm assuming many of the rest of you have done it a couple of hundred times, so you can actually hear it, because it takes a lot of doing it before you actually get to hear them well. Uh, people with a re recent myocardial infarction, obviously you don't do carotid sinus massage. Recent stroke, the same thing. If they have a history of ventricular tachycardia, you don't want to do it. And the positive is if you have an asystole event that lasts at least longer than three seconds. And in older people, three seconds is a long time. Um, so when we look at carotid sinus hypersensitivity, as I said, it occurs commonly in people over the age of 65 and about 40%. Uh, the cutoff of seven seconds may be more appropriate than the three seconds. It's associated with falls, and they may need a pacemaker if this is going on, and it's associated with abnormal cerebral autoregulation. So the treatment really is a pacemaker if they're having it often or if they're having continuous falls, and the diagnosis is relatively easy to do, though you should be prepared if you do it, and you do it a little too roughly to recognize the person may have a myocardial arrest and you have to bring them back. So don't do it out somewhere where you're not ready to do that. So orthostatic syncope, we all know about that. Uh, it's venous pooling of greater than 20% on standing. It's commonly due to an excessive loss of water or blood or failed venous constriction or increased pressure in chest or abdomen. Uh, the easiest way to do it in a physician's office is basically to have them lie down or even from sitting and then get them to stand up and monitor the blood pressure and the pulse rate at that time. Uh, some of the venous pooling causes are very interesting. Yeah, you see my favorite cause, this is the jacuzzi, but uh, drugs, neuropathy, and varicose veins, as well as the jacuzzi, can cause you to have venous pooling. Um, 
if you wear, as people used to do many, many years ago, very tight garters around your stomach, that can cause uh, basically a failure of the blood to get back to the heart. I don't think many people wear clothes like that anymore, so we're fairly safe that that's not going to be one we have to deal with. Increased pressure in the chest or abdomen. We see this in weightlifters in particular, uh, but also in people who blow things like a trumpet. So people playing a musical instrument and they suddenly faint or they feel faint, you have to think about this as the increased pressure in the chest or ab abdomen. Um, other things that we think about are the Valsalva maneuver. Uh, if you cough a lot, that would be the increased pressure in chest or, uh, or abdomen. Uh, when you're struggling to pass urine, if you've got, say, a, pro uh, a, pro a large prostate, micturition syncope is not unusual. And then when you're swallowing, you can see deglutition syncope. So lots of different causes that we may run into. The diagnosis here is made by the Valsalva maneuver, where you look at the RR interval uh, of it, uh, basically the uh, tachycardia over the bradycardia. And I think that's right, yeah. And uh, basically, uh, that if it's uh, l less than 1.2, then you're basically uh, recognizing that you might have um, less than, yeah, less than 1.2, sorry about that. And remember, the way the Valsalva works is you take a deep breath in, you're not allowed to blow, blow it out. Ideally, you have a device in your mouth that stops you blowing it out. And at the first bit, you see a little bit of an increase in the blood pressure. Then the blood pressure goes down. While the blood pressure goes down, you get a tachycardia. When you release your breath, you fundamentally have a small decrease in blood pressure, followed by the blood pressure overshoot, and that is followed by a bradycardia with the heart rate. So that is how you make the diagnosis. If any of you have ever wondered why we call it a Valsalva maneuver, this was Antonio Maria Valsalva, I think in the 18th century, but a very long time ago, was the first person to do this. Um, so when we're looking at inappropriate arterial vasodilatation, we can also get exercise syncope, uh, which uh, causes an expansion of the arteries to muscle, compression of veins, and diversion of blood from other organs. And you need to watch out for this, particularly in young people. There are some young people who have fairly severe exercise syncope. They'll often tell you that when they're running and they're running a long distance, somewhere in the middle, they just feel faint and you've got to recognize this may be the problem and you need to work with them around how to get this fixed and it's not that easy. The other syndrome that is very common in younger people but not older people is the stress or fright syndrome where you get muscular arterial vasodilatation and it's been called the playing dare. It basically, you just suddenly pass out, you're terrified and you suddenly pass out. Um, so now we go on uh, from measuring the orthostatic hypertension. And here you see an old fashioned physician measuring blood pressure. This is the way it's mostly done in a doctor's office. If you're really lucky, somebody may measure it lie, lying down, but this is the classical way it's done. Usually you come into the doctor's office. It's the one place that's most probably a total waste of time measuring blood pressure because people are usually stressed when they come to the doctor and the doctor is abnormally high. So you really need to always get a blood pressure at home or away from a stressful situation. Then, having said that's wrong, the right way to do, do it is if you're measuring it in the office somewhere, you have to get a standing blood pressure as well as ideally a lying blood pressure, looking for the drop in the blood pressure. And you, in any older person, you have to measure the blood pressure standing every time you see them. That is more useful than just getting the sitting blood pressure because you will pick up the orthostasis. And if you're not going to do it, you should make sure that your older patients are doing it at home or going into the pharmacy to get it measured. Uh, measurements of uh, blood pressure for orthostasis are appropriately done by a phenometer. I have never seen a phenometer in any doctor's office I've worked in. I hope uh, up in Kirksville, you're much better off 
and they have them around for you, but I'm highly suspicious you don't have them either, so that's how life is. Uh, so when you come to the treatment of orthostasis, obviously medications are a big cause, and you have to go through the medications and eliminate any medications that you think are causing the blood pressure to be dropped. The treatment of orthostasis is to increase the salt. I'm sure all of you have been told that we should be on a low salt diet below three. As long as you know that kills people, that means you should listen to the cardiologist. It drives me crazy, but all the data in older people says somewhere between three to four is a reasonable salt intake. If you go above four, it's grams, it's not a day, it's not good. If you go below three, you die. But, uh, you know, we have heart disease and people say, well, cut, cut it down or we blood pressure. But when you cut it down, you actually increase the death rate. So I guess it makes sense, but I have never quite understood why cardiologists haven't quite worked this one out yet. Maybe one of you in the audience can explain it to me, but the epidemiological evidence is overwhelming for not going below three. Uh, you elevate the head of be the bed at night. Uh, you should have a bedside commode because a lot of people with orthostasis get out of bed to go to the toilet at night. Uh, they're rushing to go to the toilet. They stand up quickly, and that basically causes them to faint. Obviously, you don't want to vasodilate, so you avoid hot showers. You learn to get up slowly. There is physical therapy called, called orthostatic training, and for some people that works very well, uh, and in some cases is equivalent to Job stockings. The problem with Job stockings, I'm sure you all know, is they've got to be put on while you're lying in bed in the morning. You can't sit over the edge of the bed and put them on. Uh, you know, I have enough trouble at 74 basically putting socks on my feet in the morning, uh, sitting up and reaching over. I, if I tried to do that in my bed, I would not be able to do it. So mostly people with job stockings need help putting them on. Uh, if you have two cups of co coffee in the morning, the caffeine is an adenosine ag antagonist, and that actually works very well. But you can't have any more coffee during the day because then you just basically downregulate the receptor and the coffee doesn't work anymore. And then recently in 2006, a study showed that if you cross your legs, you will have a better outcome. Uh, so then we come to the drugs that are available to treat orthostasis. And these are, mitogen is an alpha-1 adrenergic antagonist. It sort of works. It's never been shown really to work very well. This was one of these things, you know, when we asked the FDA because people are desperate for a, a drug to get it through, they got mitogen on because there was no good treatment for orthostasis and nobody's really gone back and proven that it really works. So it's out there, we use a lot of it, but the evidence is actually very limited. Uh, when we look at a Motrin, actually for people with mild orthostasis, works very well blocking uh, the prostaglandins. Uh, Fludrocortisone is most probably the most effective of the drugs. If they've got a lowish uh, uh, hematocrit, erythropoietin can be used. Uh, Desmopressin can be used for some people. Uh, 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 that's the acetate. And then uh, DOPS, which is a styphenol, Oxyphenylserine has been shown in people with Parkinson's disease in particular, and in some other conditions to work well. It's very difficult to get this through the medical insurance. I have tried a couple of times and I have yet to, to succeed. Why do we treat them? We treat people to preserve the cerebral blood flow so they're not getting a hypoxia to their brain. Uh, the next type of hypertension is the post-meal or post-prandial hypertension. I like to think of this as the Big Mac attack. You go in, you get your Big Mac, you eat it, and you have a second one, and then you fall down flat before you get out of McDonald's. That's the way to look at it. It's very variable. It doesn't occur all the time, which is a problem in the diagnosis. It's more common in the afternoon. So if you're seeing your patients in the, in, in, uh, in the morning, sorry, if you're seeing your patients in the afternoon, you actually have to get their blood pressure measured after they've done eaten breakfast in the morning before and after breakfast in the morning. You'll pick up much higher. It's present to some extent in about 26% of older people. So it's a very common condition. Uh, it's not always associated with falls, syncope, stroke, myocardial infarction, and death. 
but those are the side effects that you have. It's stimulated mainly by carbohydrate, and it's due to the release of calcitonin gene-related peptide. Uh, the antagonist of the CTRP is now being used for migraine, and it may be a treatment for postprandial hypertension, but nobody's looked at it. People who have postprandial hypertension, at least in a nursing home, are, tend to die off earlier, and the more, higher it is, the more trouble they have. This is just showing you that the glucose is mainly the piece that is causing the blood uh, uh, the blood pressure to drop. And you can stop this by using uh, uh, somatostatin on triotide uh, to stop the, the response to the glucose. Uh, and the other thing we can look at is things that increase glucagon-like peptide, because glucagon-like peptide, besides having many effects, also delays gastric emptying, and it's a delay in gastric emptying that decreases the postprandial hypertension. So a carbose, a anti-diabetic drug, uh, increases GLP-1 and also GIP fairly dramatically in a dose of 100 milligrams, and it's an excellent treatment given just before a meal to decrease postprandial hypertension. Um, and here you see the example of a carbose reducing, uh, uh, stopping the reduction in systolic blood pressure and in heart rate. Uh, the other drug that increases GLP, uh, P1 is Miglitol, uh, and basically it has also been successfully used to treat older persons with postprandial hypertension. I had one older person who, when he came to me, had been fainting at least once, sometimes twice a day, for about three years before he came to me, he'd been to the cardiologist. They'd done everything to work him up. So I actually got him to eat a meal and he dropped his blood pressure by about 60 millimeters of mercury. We put him on Miglitol and for four years after that, he went without a single effect, remembering to take the Miglitol just before the meal. And I, so it wasn't fair to say without ever having, because one time he forgot to take his Miglitol and had, had a faint, and he phoned me immediately after, and he said, I didn't think you were right, Dr. Morley, but now I believe you, so I will never forget to take it again. This is how we deal with things, but that's where life is. So the treatment for postprandial hypertension, besides the drugs we've gone through, is coffee in the morning, small meals, decrease the carbohydrate, and give fiber with the meals. And then the alpha-1 glucosidase inhibitors, if they aren't working, you can go to a creotide. So let's look quickly now at some of the black swans and zebras. Uh, so pheochromocytoma is a common cause of uh, uh, orthostatic hypertension, and they can have panic syndromes, hypertension followed by hypotension. They get a pale flush, spells, retinopathy, you measure chromogranin A as the best way to pick it up, and then you look at serum nephrons as well, and then you can go ahead and use MIGBIG to basically uh, localize where your pheochromocytoma is. Uh, systemic mastocytosis, uh, here, as you all know, there's increased gastric acid, diarrhea. Uh, you can actually write on the skin, and that's the way I've mostly diagnosed systemic mastocytosis. Somebody tells me they're having diarrhea, they're feeling faint, uh, and they've got a little bit of a skin there. You just go and you write a big A on their skin, and it comes up immediately, and it's a great way to make the diagnosis. Syncope, obviously important. Uh, the diagnostic test of choice is tryptase. Uh, Addison's disease, adrenal insufficiency, they have orthostasis, weight loss, abdominal symptoms. You think of Addison's disease when you see basically a, low, a, a high potassium, a lowish blood pressure, a, a, a decreased sodium, and eosinophilia. And that's a so triad of those three are very commonly turn out to be Addison's disease. And in the nursing home, we found lots of patients coming out of hospital who had had basically uh, syncope, who came to the nursing home with no diagnosis. And with that triad, they turn out to have basically Addison's disease, like as you all know, John Kennedy did. Uh, Eagle syndrome, which I've never seen, and I'm sure it exists, this is an elongated styloid process, these people have uh, pharyngeal pain, and they have a carotid artery syndrome, which gives them carotidinia, headaches, tinnitus, mononocular blindness, and syncope, which is a ton of things to come together. 
for what is, I think, most probably the rarest condition that I've looked for and never managed to find, okay? Uh, other zebras, uh, Vipoma, the VIP, excess production from uh, tumors of Werner Morrison syndrome will do it. Swallowing, if you have a hiatal hernia along with aclasia, this can cause uh, fainting at the time when you basically uh, swallow. Vagal paragangliomas will do it. Uh, people with paraplegia, uh, when they sit up sometimes, will have a cerebral syncope, and giant cell arteritis can do it as well. Um, so we're almost through the black swans, but I thought I should point out that if you actually are having thai, uh, uh, acupuncture, you get the Yang Cheng phenomena. It's more common in older people, and you, we need, you need to be aware that this can occur in people who are getting acupuncture. So recognizing there's nothing wrong with acupuncture, it works remarkably well for a lot of people, but if somebody is fainting during the, peri the period, you need to recognize this may not be the right treatment for them. Okay, so now we've finished syncope, we've got it out of the way, we've gone through far more things that you can possibly remember. So now we're gonna make it worse by changing to epilepsy and point out to you that epilepsy is very common in older people. You can see that there are increased incidences in epilepsy in people when they are young, and then a large increase when they're old, slightly more in males than females, starting at around about 60. And so this is a common presentation in older people. In older people, it takes about nearly two years, 1.7 years, to make the diagnosis of epilepsy uh, because we don't really think of it. So you have to have a high suspicion if somebody is, tells you they're fainting that they might have epilepsy. It's very easy if somebody comes in and says, oh, the person was shaking like mad and they fainted and passed out. You say, oh yeah, that's epilepsy. But unfortunately, most of epilepsy is not like that. When we look at the seizure classification, we know that we have the partial uh, uh, or unilateral seizures. And this is uh, associated with staying conscious during the time uh, so they have preserved consciousness, and that's a simple partial seizure. Uh, and then you have where consciousness is altered, which is a complex partial seizure. And then when you look at the ones that have bilateral origin with a bilateral onset of symptoms, here you're getting the generalized non-focal. The classic is the tonic-clonic, but we can have absence seizures. And I just had one. If you wondered why I stopped talking, no, I didn't. But uh, that's what happens. It's about as quick as that, and they get, get better straight away. You can have single myoclonic seizures, or you can have atonic, clonic, tonic seizures. So a lot of different uh, presentations. The com com partial complex seizures, Fyodor Dostoevsky was the person who had these. He had ecstasy, anguish, and convulsion. So it's presenting with a strange set of uh, uh, symptoms that are different from what you would expect. Uh, partial complex seizures, you can have visual auditory, olfactory, psychomotor, and you can have dysphagia, dysphagia, chewing problems, undoing your clothes. So you can just start chewing like this, and that can be the seizure. Temporal, you can have problems with memory. You can go into a dreamy state. You can have uh, problems with your mood. Uh, you can think that you've been in a place before, the deja vu type feeling, and then you can have fear. So we look at the prevalence of seizures and why have I gone through all these seizures? Because you see that general tonic seizures are 23%. This is why it takes so long to make the diagnosis of seizures because basically your complex partial are more common. And then you have this whole range of other seizures here and recognize that you've got to think of all of these. Uh, if you're a neurologist, I'm sure it's easy to remember them, but I started out life being a neurologist and I tell, can tell you that about a week after I stopped being a neurologist, I'd forgotten about all the different kinds of seizures. So what we're trying to do here for all of you is say, recognize that if you can't find an obvious answer, there are many not so obvious answers. Either go look them up or send the person to someone who specializes in this area. 
important if you think the person's having seizures, you can make the diagnosis if you can get a blood quickly enough because prolactin de- increases in between 20 minutes to 60 minutes after a seizure and then it goes down. So if you can get an elevated prolactin that goes down, that's most probably the easiest way to help you make the diagnosis of a seizure if somebody is in hospital. Uh, CPK is elevated by 24 hours, but only in 10% of the motor seizures. And in the first hour, you'll get an elevation in lactate as well. Okay, now we move on to dizziness. So I hope you all got dizzy watching this. The external world seems to revolve around the individual or in which the individual seems to revolve in space. Uh, And there are multiple causes of dizziness. This is the unfair thing about all these spells. There are always multiple causes. You know, and and when I was a medical student, I learned one or two of each. And I thought I was very bright that I knew one or two causes. And I most of my life, I've never really learned all these other causes, except when I put a talk together to remind people that at least you've got to realize the others. So for dizziness, acoustic neuromas, arteriosclerosis, uh, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is common. Uh, Meniere's disease is another one that's fairly common. Labyrinthitis, uh, vestibular neuronitis, ototoxicity, that's the people who take drugs like gentamicin in too higher doses, and then people who have osteoarthritis in their ear can also develop it. So if we look at patient complaints of this, you know, if you have a sensation of motion that's vertigo, these are the vestibular disorders, and they're either going to be central within the brain, uh, stem predominantly, or they're going to be peripheral. This is uh, the motion sickness type things, the vestibular neuronitis, the BPPV, and the Meniere's disease. If you have a sensation of impending faint and near syncope, this is usually the cardiovascular disorders, and you should look for the same causes as you would look in syncope. Don't forget aortic stenosis as a not uncommon cause in older people of the near syncope. Sensation of losing balance to equilibrium is always neurological do- disorders. Uh, these are cerebellar dysfunction, extrapyramidal disorders, drug intoxications, posterior fossa tumors, and so on. And then if you have ill-defined lightheadedness, well, I'm just like this all the time. I don't know, doctor, I'm really very <coughs> confused. <coughs> Confused, excuse me, and I feel very dizzy. This is basically the person who's hyperventilating, usually has anxiety, neurosis, or an affective disorder. But before you make that diagnosis, make sure you're not missing one of all these others that are here. So for BPPV, it's 20% of all the cases. It occurs most in the fifth to seventh decades. It's bilateral in 10%. So the majority of them are only. Uh, occurring in one uh, ear, and it's associated if you've had head head trauma in the past, vestibular neuritis, and Meniere's disease. Uh, How do you make the diagnosis? Well, it's a positional uh, uh, thing, and in 1921, Varani uh, basically pointed out it was a positional vertigo, and in 1952, Dixon Hall Corpite created their maneuver. You see this lady, she's sitting up, and she's sitting up where she's, when you bring her head down, you're not going to break it against something. You're going to hold her gently, tell her not to panic, and you're going to move her rapidly down till she's flat, and you'll her, turn her head to one side and ask if she's uh, feeling dizzy, and you'll look for nystagmus. Then you do it on the other side. Uh, it's sort of a fun thing to do, particularly when the person has it. You feel very good about it. I don't know any patient who's really enjoyed me doing it, but nevertheless, I've got lots of fun out of doing it. Meniere's disease, which is often overdiagnosed as a condition in which the inner ear cannot drain and the lymph. Uh, you get fluctuations in the ability to hear. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it isn't. You get episodes of dizziness. You get tinnitus, little sounds in your ear, and you have a feeling of pressure in your ear. Um, Its treatment is to give a diuretic and a low-salt diet. Uh, You can use vestibular suppressants if you want to. 
though they sometimes cause more problems than they help. And then there are whole kinds of sets of surgery. So this is somebody who, if you make the diagnosis, most probably should go to see an ENT surgeon. Uh, the vestibular suppressants are listed here for you. And if you start looking at them, the meclizine, I think, is the one we use most. But all of these can basically mess with your body. Uh, they can cause you to have orthostasis. They can cause you not to think well. They're just not the greatest of drugs around. So we have to recognize that. So yes, in some people, they do remarkably well. Uh, I, I have used Robinol Fort, which has made, uh, which is like a paralyte in quite a lot of my patients over the year. It seems to have the least side effects and actually work very well. So it's worth a try if you're trying to work out what to do. Very rare and first described in 1998, which was well into my career uh, by minor is superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Uh, you can see in the picture down here, this is bilateral semicircular canal dehiscence. So diagnosis is made with a CT of the head. They have chronic disequilibrium. It gets worse if there's a noise around. Uh, if you blow your nose, it gets worse. And it's often a, a brought on by gazing intently at something. Uh, you, they get both vertical and torsional nystagmus. You, the CT makes the diagnosis and uh, you can do visually evoked myogenic potentials and they have a lower threshold for those. Uh, the treatment, you avoid, avoid inciting stimuli. Uh, you can use a pressure equalization tube. Uh, there's limited experience, but getting more with surgical repair and the patients I've seen who've had with surgical repair have done very well. So maybe the treatment of choice early on rather than going through all the other things. And then you have to counsel them that this is what's going on if you don't get it fixed. Alternative medicine, there's always one alternative medicine and the one that seems to work best for uh, dizziness is ginger. You know, if you have car sickness, taking some ginger before you go on your car trips often works very well for people. And uh, available data limited, but it does seem to work for a subset of people. If you're thinking the person's having nystagmus and you want to find it properly, you use friends or glasses. Uh, the only reason I can see for anybody who's not an ENT to know about this is it might come up on your boards at some stage, uh, either when you're first writing them or later in your life, seeing they never seem to disappear. I'm still busy writing boards, you know, so it doesn't go away. So you should at least know they exist and they done to allow you to pick up nystagmus fairly easy. There are a whole set of exercises for dizziness. And again, I'm not even going to go through these except to say the Epley Maneuver most probably is one of the best ones, but this is physical therapy and you need to find a physical therapist who knows how to do these exercises. And it's not necessarily universal. There are people who specialize in doing them. They know how they're doing it. If they do them and teach the patient to do them well, the patients tend to do very well. So you, you see some examples here uh, with the Epley down at the bottom. You can actually just take a business card, position it at eye level, and fundamentally get the person to turn their head uh, from one side to the other. And that actually can, in some cases, make a difference. Uh, so the final part of spells are the delirium equivalents, people who become delirious. And we have to remember that older people in hospital, somewhere between 20 to 30% have some degree of delirium. This is very underdiagnosed, at least in all the literature. I know up in Kirksville, you make the diagnosis every time you see somebody with delirium. Uh, you don't do what we do at SLU, which is tie them down in bed because torture is not a good thing for old people. I spent 31 years at SLU trying to convince them of this and fail. I hope I wouldn't have to convince an osteopathic person that torture is not good for their patients. So I'm feeling fairly good about the fact that you already know you don't tie people with delirium down, uh, just in case you thought you should. And there are multiple causes of delirium. Drugs obviously are a very common cause. Emotional can occur uh, with depression being the major one and some mania. Uh, low oxygen states are important. Infection, 
retention of urinal feces, people who are having ictal events, uh, uh, the seizures we talked about, people with underhydration and undernutrition, uh, a whole slew of metabolic ones, but the classically B12 and, uh, and hypothyroidism, and then subdural hematomas. So lots of different causes uh, precipitated by lots of different things. Uh, you're going to make the diagnosis. I like the 4AT, which is available, comes out of Vasco. It's a simple screen. It should be done by nurses at least twice a day in any older person in hospital. And if it's abnormal, they should look for delirium and ask you, the doctor to look for delirium as well. Remember, a lot of delirium presents not with the agitated person, but just with somebody who appears as if they're out of it. So I'm sick and I'm lying in bed and I'm not getting good responses from the patient. This suggests delirium and you need to be aware of that because this lack of attention is just as common as the agitated form of delirium. So I think that I've gone through the remarkably 57 slides in about 45 minutes, uh, maybe less than that. Uh, that was to make you go totally crazy more than anything else. But I am happy to answer questions that you might have. And particularly, I'm interested in your thoughts about how you approach spells. What do you think about them? And are there anything that the osteopaths do better at dealing with spells than do general internists? I think the answer here is most probably no, but there are one or two manipulations that might work fairly well for some of them. Okay, questions. Silence. So hopefully you all remember to register seeing I'm looking at the at all the comments and the major comment is to make sure that you register. So hopefully you all remember to register. Let's see if I can find anything else. Nope. So the big thing besides saying hello to one another, ah, and there's a new message. Uh, oh, and here's the link for the form to register. This is like me going to Grand Rounds this morning at SLU, getting there late, but all I was doing was looking for the registration form. So as long as you find it and fill it out, that's the most important thing. So any questions? I did have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure. What was the age on the standing blood pressure? What 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 was the you mean what what is what, the difference when you stand to uh, make what, well at what age would you start doing a standing blood pressure? Uh, well, basically, uh, given that I used to do endocrinology, I, I used to do it from about the age of 50 because a lot of endocrine conditions have orthostasis as well. But certainly anybody age 65 and above, uh, it's worthwhile doing. You, you'll be amazed how many people you pick up with orthostasis and, you know, you can work with them, um, make sure that they get it under control and it makes a big difference down the line. So. 65 and beyond, very definitely. Um, if somebody's fainting, you've definitely got to, you know, you should always measure a standing blood pressure as well as a lying one. Uh, if you're in an, a physician's office, if you just do a sitting and a standing one when they come in uh, over the age of 65, you'll be amazed how much orthostasis you'll pick up. It's, you know, somewhere around 20 to 30% of older people have some degree that doesn't mean they all need uh, treating, but a lot of them are there uh, have that because you're over-treating their blood pressure and giving them orthostasis. So sometimes just by getting rid of drugs, you can solve the problem. That's great. Thank you. Other thoughts? I know you knew all of this, uh, you know. As of course, I knew all of it before I put the talk together about five years ago, and I pulled it out for this and I started looking and I said, hey, I don't know that. I can't remember that. You know, this sort of thing happens to us. I know it doesn't happen to you guys. It's just me who can't remember anything. Uh, so it's the caffeine. Somebody asked about tea. It's the caffeine that is the adenosine uh, in, in inhibitor not tea. Tea doesn't have anything that will do it. So it's really a direct effect of blocking at the aden adenosine receptor. Thank you, Hong, for asking that. Uh, 
Any other thoughts? So you knew it all, I guess, you know. With no no questions means you knew it all, you know. Uh, no arguments means not only did you know it all, but you didn't think it was worthwhile knowing. Okay, so we can go through all sorts of possibilities that I'm teasing you a little bit. Uh, but if there are no more questions, any others there? You, you know, you shouldn't be shy to ask questions. The, the way you learn is asking questions. Well, sorry, that's the way I've learned all my life. So I'm quite happy to always ask stupid questions because there's no such thing as a stupid question. And if I ask what is, quote, a stupid question, I get an answer. That means that I won't be stupid the next time. But I think I've either exhausted you or something. Okay, uh, anybody else or can we call it a day? Deathly silence. Oh, yeah. I don't think I missed anything in the group chat. Um, the, the Didn't thing. any other questions come through on the group chat. Does anybody have any other questions, comments? Disagreements, I love it. Of course, I, I can argue with anyone. That's the one thing in my life I've been able to do well. Even, even <laughs> if I, I can argue into, in, into believing you're wrong, okay. I'm teasing. Well, if there's um, no other questions, um, thank you, Dr. Morley, for taking time to present to us today. And um, if anybody has any questions, um, you can email me and then I will um, get them to Dr. Morley if there's any questions afterwards. Okay, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Okay, uh, so thanks. And if you need my slides, um, uh, Debbie can get them for you. Deborah Bessing can get them for you. Okay. Okay, Thank guys. Thank you, Dr. Morley. Thank you very much. Bye.